All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. How many people have been at one of my previous sessions? How many people were at the uh, Aaron Margosis' sysinternal session a little bit earlier? Okay, so about, looks like about half of you. Welcome to the case of un the unexplained. One more question. Has anybody been to a previous case of the unexplained talk? So quite a few of you, about 20%, I guess. Everybody's seen this slide, so I'll skip that and get right to the, the meat. This is the, the outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. First, uh, introducing the whole background behind the case of the unexplained and why we're here and what I'm going to try to teach you and what I, I don't expect to be able to teach in a 75-minute session. And then we're going to actually look at real cases. And I've divided those into a few categories, sluggish performance, application hangs, stalls where applications just seem to, to go off into the weeds, error messages that are unex undefined, unexplained, application crashes, and then finally blue screens. This talk is actually, I've given this talk several times, but every time I give this talk, it's different. So the fundamental information I give you is pretty much the same. The tools, the to quick to tour through the tools that I use is pretty much unchanged. In some deliveries, the tools are different. Like uh, in one of the previous case of the unexplained, I talked about a tool called Kern Rate that I'm not going to be talking about today. I use Spy++ in a previous case of the unexplained that I'm not going to be talking about today. For the most part, though, the tool tours are the same. And what's different are the cases. Every single case of the unexplained I give, I use different examples. And uh, fortunately, there's no shortage, for some reason, of cases to share with people. And I've actually, uh, at one point, was offering signed copies of the Windows Internals book to people that would send me their cases, screenshots and log files. I had to stop that very quickly because I ran out of books. And it would have been really expensive for me to keep doing that. So I've actually got uh, two slide decks. I had to break them apart because they're so big and unwieldy with all the screenshots in them. The total, co to total count on slides, if you put them together, is over 380 slides of just cases. And that means that every time I deliver this talk, I can just go back to that master deck and pull examples out that are different every, and, and show different techniques uh, and d different interesting stories every time. So if you like this talk and you want to go see other examples, you can view webcasts of the 2007 and 2008 versions of this talk off the SysInternals website on the link marks webcast. And the TechEd US talk, case of talk that I delivered just a few months ago is also different from what you're going to see today. Oh, one more thing. Uh, some of these cases are also have been written up in my blog. So I've got a blog series called The Case of the Unexplained. Anybody following that blog series? So a few of you. If you like this kind of stuff, the cases that I find particularly interesting I write up in the blog post in in-depth in detail about how the person or myself went through troubleshooting the problem. So troubleshooting. I assume most of you aren't, aren't just here to occupy the last session of the day before you head out. You're here probably because you've run into problems on occasion using Windows. The reason why we need to troubleshoot is that applications, when they run into problems, typically don't tell you in very clear words what they've run into, what problem they've run into, and how to fix the problem. And there's uh, one of the reasons for that is that application developers code for the common expected cases, and they spend little time either developing or testing the paths that are, unexplained, that, are, that are unexpected, that rarely would happen. So when the application runs into something like a locked file, like a registry value that it didn't expect, like a permissions problem, trying to access some resource that it always expects to be able to access, it ends up going down some random path in the code that the developer never even anticipated and ends up doing a number of different things, like crashing, like hanging, like showing you an uh, error message with a bizarre hex number or an error message that has nothing to do at all with the root cause of the problem. And when you run into those things, what you want to do is look under the hood. Look behind the scenes to see what's going on and what might have triggered the application to behave in those ways. So what I'm going to teach you today is give you a quick tour of how to interpret process activity, file system activity, registry activity, 
They show you one of the most key things about troubleshooting, key tools at, at your disposal for troubleshooting, and that's called the call stack, which can help you root cause particular issues, pinpointing the exact reason that something's happening, which wouldn't be otherwise possible without the call stack. You're also going to learn the tools and techniques to go about troubleshooting and so solve what's on the surface. If you heard the, the problem, you would say, well, there's probably really no way to solve that. And in fact, just with a little bit of work, you can solve a lot of these presumably unsolvable problems. So these are the tools we're going to use. A bunch of tools from System Turtles. Not all of them I'm going to use in this session. In fact, out of the System Turtles tools, I'm only using a handful. This list is here because in other cases, case ofs, I've used uh, a number of these, all of these tools at one point or another. And then there's some Microsoft general tools that I've used in case of, like I mentioned, current rate and SPI++, I'm not talking about in this slide deck, but I am going to be using the debugging tools for Windows package, which is a free download there from Microsoft.com. So everything that I'm talking about today is, falls in the, on this slide as far as where it's coming from. Our first category of symptoms is sluggish performance. How many people have experienced sluggish performance on a Windows system? Uh, okay, how many people that haven't used Vista have experienced sluggish performance? Okay, quite a few of you. The tool that I'm going to start with in this first case that somebody sent in to me is Process Explorer. And how many people have used Process Explorer? Just about. How many people have not used Process Explorer? One person in the back. <laughs> You're excused. So Process Explorer is a task manager replacement you're all familiar with. You can actually literally replace task manager by going to the options menu and s selecting replace task manager. One of the things that I always do is just put it in my start folder so that it always starts up. And I use the slash E switch on the shortcut so that it prompts me for elevation so that it's always running with admin privileges. So when I log into the machine, I always get one prompt, and that's from Process Explorer, and then it minimizes itself into the tray with that icon you see there. Right off the bat, there's some very visible differences between what you see in Process Explorer and what you see in Task Manager. So Task Manager is just a flat list of processes. What Process Explorer shows you is a process tree structure, which shows you the parent-child relationships between processes. And right there, there's some, a piece of information how processes are related to each other might give you a, a hint about what the purpose of a process is or how it might have gotten started or why it might have gotten started. Here in this process tree, we see that explorer.exe is the parent of just about everything that's colored in blue here, and that's because that's my shell. When I logged in, that was the first process that launched as me. It's actually the second user in it was the first one, that launched the shell Explorer, which is why Explorer sh looks like an orphan here because its parent no longer is around. And then everything I've launched since then has been indirectly through Explorer one way or another. The blue highlighting, therefore, is any process that's running in the same user account as Process Explorer itself. And you can see there's some blue up here. This is a task host process, which is uh, something that's running scheduled tasks running those scheduled tasks as me. And so that's why those show up in blue as well. Going back to the tree, because the parent-child relationships are represented by the tree and the services.exe process is the service control manager, right there we could see that any child of services.exe is going to be a Windows service hosting process. So Windows services are these processes or components that run regardless of whether somebody is logged in, providing background operation for the system. Every child of services.exe is a service hosting process, and that's why they show up in that pink color. The local security authority subsystem also shows up in pink because it is also hosting some Windows services that I'll show you in a second. But the other things that you see right off the bat are different columns. This is a, a private build of Process Explorer that I haven't released yet, so these defaults here are, are different than the current public version. I've decided to show the private bytes column and the working set column just by default, because the number one troubleshooting issue for memory-related problems is private bytes being leaked by a process, and so that's very easy to detect 
or track down who's leaking private bytes just by sorting by that column. And then the working set shows you just how hungry these processes are for using RAM. And that might give you an idea of who's, who's the biggest user of physical memory on a particular system. Then the description and company name. Those come from the executable images themselves. There's no database in Process Explorer at all or any of the SysInternals tools. They purely are taking information that's there and available for them. Developers put these things, these strings, in the images as their version resources. So if you right-click and you look at the version information for an image, that's the same kind of information you're seeing here. You'll notice as I move the mouse around, I see these tooltips. And these tooltips show uh, for any process, uh, any image that I'm hovering over, the full path to the executable image, which is why we don't need to have a separate column showing you where that image lies. And for anything that might be hosting multiple components, which includes services, you're going to see not just the, the path, but also the services running inside of it. Let me scroll down a little bit so we can see that full thing. And I mentioned that LSAS, Local Security Authority Subsystem, is hosting some Windows services. Those are shown right there in the tooltip. So you can see LSAS is running a cryptographic key isolation service, the EFS service, net logon, protected storage, and, and the security accounts manager services. There are a, a tremendous number of other things that you can look at just in the process view with Process Explorer. There, this is the column selection dialog for selecting which columns you want to be, have visible in the dialog at any particular point in time. And there's three pages of it, of these columns, for the process view, which is what we're looking at. And this talk focuses on troubleshooting particular types of problems, so there's lots of things that I'm not going to be delving into for how to, how to look at this stuff, but you should be aware that there's other information that we're not going to cover today. If you want to dig a little bit deeper into a process, that's when you open up the process properties dialog. And I've opened it up for Explorer. The first thing you see on the image tab is the version information again. You see that it's verified. I actually have turned on image verification by default, which is a way to, to verify that this thing is actually from Microsoft, which is something you might want to do to hunt out malware that pretends to be from Microsoft. It shows you the version number. This uh, is the timestamp that the image was built, as opposed to this timestamp right down here, which is the time that the, this process launched. And this can be useful if you're looking for correlating process startups with some particular issue you detected. The startup time can be useful there. One of the things that is one of the uh, useful things about troubleshooting or for troubleshooting is baselining a system, understanding what the system looks like under normal conditions so you can spot abnormalities. And that's what this comment field is for. If you put, type in a comment here, and then you hover, you'll see the comment for that. You can also add the comment as a column. So this is one way you could go and identify every process on your system, on your server, put in a comment for it, indicating the fact that you've actually looked at this thing and verified that you know what it's doing on your server. And then you could easily spot anything that doesn't have a comment as something that you haven't seen before. One of the other aspects of, of Process Explorer is not just delving into process-specific information. And actually, I, I kind of skipped over the other tabs in the, the process dialog. The process, the, here's the performance tab, which shows you things like CPU usage, I.O. usage, virtual memory usage, physical memory usage. You have that stuff broken down into per-process graphs that look a lot like the task manager graph. And as you can see, if I hover the, the tooltip, it'll show me what point in time that sample was taken. The threads we'll come back to later. The TCP IP tab will show you open TCP IP endpoints. So Explorer's got one open for some reason. The security tab shows us the information about what sh uh, the process token, so what account this is running in, what session it's running in for a terminal service session, and the security identifiers of any users and groups. And for some reason, the network connection, well, I'm not connected to the domain, so these domain SID lookups are failing. The environment variable tab shows us the environment variables that thing is running under. This can be sometimes be useful for troubleshooting. Be Oops, sorry about that. Because so, uh, some applications 
check environment variables to modify their behavior, to, to look in certain places. They've got configura basically configuration settings stored as environment variables. I just got a case sent to me today where a process was misbehaving because its environment variable was set incorrectly. And then the final tab over here is the strings tab, which scans the image, either in memory or on disk, depending on whether you've got this, th these buttons selected down here, looking for fr printable strings. This isn't typically very useful for troubleshooting unless you've come across an image that you don't, you can't identify. You've done web searches on it, you can't identify it. You're saying, what the heck is this thing? Looking inside of its image for strings that might give you a clue about where it came from is something that this will allow you to do. So let's get back to the, the case, our first case here. This is the, I call it the case of the service hog, host CPU hog. And in fact, I'm going to create a similar situation here on my system because I've created, let me find it. I've created a little test process which has uh, a couple of uh, threads in it that are at that are uh, consuming a lot of resource. And so let me start these up for you. And we're going to see sim something similar to what this person saw uh, when they were looking at the, oh, there we go, there's the one I want. What this person saw when they were looking at their tray, they saw what I just saw there at the bottom is something consuming CPU. That's uh, another advantage of always having Process Explorer running, is noticing when something's actually killing your machine, which might not be otherwise detectable. You might seem to feel like the system's operating OK. But especially on a laptop, if something's burning the CPU like that, your battery life is going to be killed. And it's not uncommon to run into, especially flash apps on web pages, that will burn your CPU. And if you don't notice it in this way, then you can run into problems. And I've, on many occasions, noticed CPU being consumed down there and then gone and been able to close the web page that was host hosting that Flash app that was causing me problems. So what this person saw on this day is when they had high CPU usage, they hovered the tooltip, uh, hovered the mouse over that tray and saw this tooltip. CPU usage 47%. It was being caused by a service host. And they went and looked at that service host CPU history and they saw that this thing had been using CPU for a long time before they actually noticed it, doing who knows what. So the question was, what is causing this CPU usage? Service host is a service hosting process. Its job in life is to do nothing other than host other services. So it's kind of a shell process where other services are implemented as DLLs that load into it. So just by seeing that service host was consuming CPU doesn't tell us anything about what service is actually consuming CPU. So he needed to look inside of the process at the threads inside of it. So this brings us to what's the difference between a process and a thread? A process is a container. It holds an address space where data and code is mapped into. It holds resources that keep track of what open operating system resources the process has. And it has a security profile that we saw in the security tab that is the identity of this process as it goes around the system, accessing objects and trying to leverage certain win security privileges. Processes don't run. It's threads that actually run. Threads execute code. They're scheduled by the Windows scheduler depending on their priorities. And every thread has, shares the same per process address space. So they're all executing in the same container. That means if one thread goes crazy and starts scribbling over things, they're impacting all of the other threads in that process. One pro particular process that's worth calling out, or several of them actually at the top here, are one system process here. And that system process is the home for kernel mode threads, threads that just spend their whole life beneath the surface in kernel mode. And these include worker threads for the operating system and special threads for, the, for device drivers that can create their own system threads. The other two processes worth calling out here are interrupts and DPCs. So interrupts and DPCs are pseudo processes 
that Process Explorer presents here to show you CPU activity that's attributed to hardware interrupts or software interrupts in some way. Uh, interrupts are hardware interrupts, DPCs are software interrupts. And if you've got a problem where the, your system is feeling sluggish and you open Task Manager and Task Manager says nothing's running, it might be because you've got interrupts or DPC storm happening because of faulty hardware or a buggy device driver. And that will be visible in Process Explorer, but not Task Manager, which just buckets interrupt time into idle. Has anybody ever seen that, where your system is, seems to be idle, but it's being killed by interrupts? So a bunch of you have. And that's the reason this is called out there. How do we dig into these, con these host processes, service host, Internet Explorer, MMC snap-ins, that if they're causing you problems, how do you look inside to see what inside of it's causing a problem? That's where looking at the threads tab, which I skipped over, gives you a clue of what's going on. And to look at the threads tab, you're going to want to open up the process that's causing you problems. In my case, it's this one, this service host. And if I double click and sort by CPU usage, I see that there's two threads that are busy consuming CPU. There, I'm seeing the CPU usage. I'm seeing cycles delta. So what cycles delta are, are the number of actual processor cycles that have been executed by that thread between snap, uh, snapshots of Process Explorer, between its refresh interval, which is by default one second. The reason that I show that is because some threads can run beneath the radar of Windows time accounting system or beneath the radar of something that would show up as a percentage of CPU. And you can see that right here. These, this thread and this thread and this thread, they're all running a little bit but not enough to show up in CPU usage. And so this is there to give you an insight into what's actually running versus what's asleep and not causing the problems. The start address column is really the interesting thing here. And the start address column gives you an idea of where that thread began its life, which can give you a clue about what that thread's purpose is. The re the the, to make the best use of the start address column, you need to configure Process Explorer's symbol information. And you do that by going to the Options dialog and going to Configure Symbols. And I've configured it here to point at the Debugging Tools for Windows Package DBG help file and to try to pull symbols for the operating system images from the Microsoft Public Symbol Server. This is documented in the Debugging Tools help file. And once you've configured Process Explorer in that way, then for any built-in components of Windows, it can go pull down symbols on demand, drop them into that cache directory that I've specified there, C symbols publics, and then resolve those addresses in the threads tab. And that's why we were seeing addresses there for a bunch of those threads. Now, I see two threads consuming CPU. One of them is consuming roughly 50%, and the other one's consuming uh, roughly 5%. One of them has a start address that looks like it's giving away the clue, a clue about what the purpose of that service is. It looks like the purpose of that service is to do nothing but to hog the CPU. And that's because I made this service just for this demonstration. And that, so right there, we were able to get some insight into what's causing some of the CPU usage in that service host just by the start address of the thread. What this user saw when they went to their service host threads tab are a whole bunch of threads consuming CPU. You can see there's, uh, they're consuming anywhere between 0.19 and 7.35% of the CPU. They all have start addresses in this QManager DLL, QMGR.DLL, and their start address is task scheduler, work group worker thunk. Looking at that start address, task scheduler, hmm, maybe this has something to do with the scheduled task. So he, he went and opened this, the task scheduler interface and looked at what tasks were running. You can see there are three tasks, the system sound service, a system task, which is a certificate services client task, and a user task, which is a certificate services client task. None of these seem like they should be causing the kind of CPU usage he's seeing. So his next question is, what is that, where, what are those threads doing? What is Q Manager? 
He went back to Process Explorer to look for the Queue Manager service. Let's go take a look at the Services tab here for this particular service host. And you can see there's a number of services hosted in this side of this service host. One of them has a name that matches that DLL, that thread start address that we saw, the service hog service. And you can see what DLL it's implemented in over here. And down here at the bottom, well, let me select it first, and then we can see its description. And so it, you can see it's got a very important job in life, and that's just to, to cause problems like this. What they saw was the bits service was looked like uh, was the service that was running inside of the queue manager D DLL, and the bits is the background intelligent transfer service. Background intelligent transfer service is used by Windows Update. So the next step was to try to see wh if what this thing was updating or doing or downloading or transferring. He ran Process Monitor and didn't see anything interesting. And I'm going to move quickly past this because I'm going to delve into Process Monitor on the next case that we look at. But he didn't find anything useful there in any case, and so he went to, knowing that bits is the engine behind Windows Update, he went to the Windows Update interface and saw that he had a bunch of pending updates. And so he thought, hmm, maybe if I install these updates, then things will, uh, that CPU usage problem will go away. So he pressed install updates and it got hung here on preparing to install, just indefinitely. He even tried restarting the service the bit service, and the problem wouldn't go away. That service host still kept on running. So he needed to dig in another level deeper. What are those busy threads doing? And for that, he needed to turn to the stack. So let's talk, take a step back and talk about what stacks are used for. Each thread has this private region of memory. If you came to the Pushing the Limits talk yesterday, you know it's two megabytes by default, where it can store information to keep track of its execution and to pass parameters among the functions that make up software components. In this picture right here, I've got function one that's called function two that's called function three. What would happen as those functions called each other? The thread would push parameters onto the stack that function one wants to pass to function two. Then it would call function two and the CPU would store the return address into function one on the stack so that when function two's done, it knows where to go back to in function one. And then function two might store local variables on the stack as well. So it's really kind of a history of leading up to where the thread is right now when you look at the stack. And this, again, is like one of the, the key tools for troubleshooting cases. How do you look at the call stack? You go and open. the threads tab, find the thread that you're interested in, and we're not interested in the service hog thread because we know what it's for. In fact, what we can do to get it out of our way is go to suspend it down here, and now that I've suspended it, it's not consuming any more CPU, but we still have this one, which look at its start address. It began its life in this TPP worker thread. That's a very generic start address. It's in a system DLL, NTDLL, so we have really no idea at this point what this thread is associated with. For that, let's try to look at the stack. We double click, and if we look through the stack, the key is looking from the bottom to the top, because that's the order of execution, where RTL user thread start, called base thread init thunk, called TPP worker thread. This is the thread start address we saw on the threads tab. The reason we don't see this is, which is the real start address of the thread, is it's kind of useless. All threads begin their life here, so I actually want to show you something useful, so I show you this address, which is what the programmer said the thread should start doing when it initializes. Well, that called TPP work P execute callback, and look, we just called into something inside of servicehog.dll. We've confirmed at this point that this thread consuming CPU also is associated with that service hog service, and so now we can to take appropriate steps to resolve that problem. And what I'm going to do in this case is, again, suspend this so we don't have this thing consuming our CPU. What he did is he looked at the stack and saw that the busy threads 
we're all in Windows Update Engine, W-U-A-N, W-U-A-U-A-E-N-G dot D-L-L. He went and then went back to the services tab and confirmed that Windows Update was also inside of this service host. Bits was in it, and so was Windows Update. So at this point, he confirmed that something was screwy with Windows Update, and he restarted the Windows Update service, and the CPU usage stopped, and then his updates worked. He went back to the Windows Update, and they all installed successfully. This is an important lesson in troubleshooting, because did we actually figure out why Windows Update was screwed up? We didn't. But with a little bit of troubleshooting, we figured out what was going on, and we were able to mitigate it, in this case by restarting it, instead of just living with it or blindly rebooting the whole machine to see if the problem went away, we were able to do a kind of a precision workaround. And I consider this just as successful a troubleshooting case as if you actually figured out why Windows Update was screwed up. And that might be something that there's no way for you to ever figure out unless you're the developer for Windows Update. So by the way, if those of you that are using that reboot and hope it works thing, you're violating a patent that Dell owns How many people are violating that patent, just out of curiosity? If, how many people are violating that patent but work for Microsoft? Because we cross license with Dell, so we're OK. All right, let's talk about application hangs now. And this, I'm going to get into using Process Monitor. Process Monitor is a, a real-time file system registry thread monitor. It also captures network activity. This slide really just gives you a comparison between it and FileMon and Regimon if you happen to still be using FileMon and Regimon. And I know that from the previous session that some of you are, this is a way better tool, I promise you, than FileMon and Regimon. You need to switch to this. There's a, a saying that we've got that me and Dave Solomon have developed, and that is, when in doubt, run process monitor. When my daughter comes home with homework questions, I have her run process monitor first to see if that will help. The thing, the reason this motto has come about is because there's cases where you wouldn't even think that Process Monitor would show you to solve the problem for you or give you a clue, and it really does. Uh, one of my favorite examples of Dave not following this, this motto himself is he was on a, a he had been called to do this class for Compact, at Compact uh, Moment of Silence for Compact. He, those Compact people that remember Compact, he was called to do a troubleshooting class, and they've got this special tool this, for their kernel developers that, that's a kernel analysis tool. And they said, hey, Dave, while you're coming down here to teach Windows internals, how about if you teach us this uh, kernel analysis tool we've got in-house? And Dave said, yeah, sure. Well, Dave's a big procrastinator, which is something that I learned as I co-authored the books with him. When he, uh, we used to work, actually, live next to each other, and, and he'd come over to my house to work on the book, and every day he came over slightly later. And he argued that, well, he was just shifting time zones going further west. But it's really because Dave's got a procrastination problem. And in this case, he waited till the plane ride down to Compact to Houston from where he was to actually launch this thing and take a look at what he was supposed to teach the next morning. So he launches the setup program, and he gets this error dialog box that says, this, uh, this smart, Compact smart scope isn't supported on this hardware. Well, he's got a Toshiba laptop, and immediately figures, uh-oh, this thing only wants to run on compact hardware. And now I'm screwed. So he starts sweating. He calls the, the flight attendant, asks for a stiff drink. She goes up and prepares it, comes back and sees that she's got a, a customer that's in distress, and leans over and says, sir, can I, is there anything I can do to help you? And he's like, oh, I don't know, I'm, I'm really flustered. And he points at the screen and shows her the error message, and she says, well, have you tried running process monitor? <laughs> So we, now we, we never forget that motto now after that. <laughs> this particular case is my own case. Well, kind of my own, kind of shared with somebody else, because I participated in the keynote at TechEd US. And as part of the, the keynote demos that I wanted to do, I wanted to show a problem steps recorder. And I also wanted to show how app compat shims that, work, that were designed for Vista also work on Windows 7. So I had this buggy application that a friend of mine wrote, intentionally buggy, called Stock Viewer. And the, the idea was to run Stock Viewer 
and watch it do its buggy things and then apply the shim and show how it worked and show how that worked also on Vista. Well, the, when you do a keynote, a big keynote like that, you've got somebody that's in charge of the demos and this guy was helping me prepare the demos and so he goes back to the lab, I send him the stock viewer demo, he's going to get it set up on the, the demo machines and he emails me and he says, Mark, we've got, we've got a problem. And this is like a few days before the keynote. That stock viewer app, it takes literally minutes. It takes a minute and a half to launch. And that's just, we can't do that in the, the keynote. We don't want a boring keynote because Microsoft never does boring keynotes. <laughs> so uh, I asked him, I immediately turned around and said, capture process monitor trace. So a few minutes later, he sends me back the process monitor trace. And I started to look at it. Let's take a look at what I saw. And here I want to point out, give you a quick tour of process monitor before I open that log file to show you some of the things that you might not be familiar with. The, when we start out, all of you probably have seen the basic usage here, sequence number, time of day, process name, process ID, operation, the path, the result, and the detail column, which shows you lots of detail. This is one of the reasons why process monitor is so much better than file monitor regmon is it shows you a tremendous amount of detail about in each individual operations, like the parameters that were passed into a particular write operation. The offsets, the prior, even the I.O. priority. So a whole bunch of things that not are visible in file monitor regmon. These are just the default columns. There's a whole bunch of other columns you can add with the select column dialog divided into a bunch of categories. Application details, which you, where it include things like the image path, the command line, the company name. You don't actually need that, that image path, though, because if you hover the tooltip over the process column, then you will see the tooltip, just like you do in Process Explorer, that points at the image path. Event-related information that's specific to the particular event, like the time, relative time, from the start of the trace, the current time of the event, how long that event took, which can be useful for troubleshooting if you've got something where it, which looks sluggish. If an operation is going across the network, for example, to a network share, you will see a very long delay in that duration column or that duration field for the event. And then process management statistics, like even down to which thread performed the operation which FileMon and Regimon also didn't show you. The session, if you're interested in terminal server sessions, and the user, and some other information. So just to point out that there's a lot of information that you can see, all of that information, though, is visible when you open the event properties dialog. So everything that you can add as a column is also accessible through this. Here's the event-related details. Here's the process-related details. And then finally, the stack, which I'll come back to in a second. Again, this is a session that's uh, aimed at troubleshooting, not general system performance analysis. And there's a lot of things that here that I don't have time to show you, like a process activity summary. This is a graph that summarizes the activity file system, CPU, registry, and network across all the processes, as well as their commit usage and their working set usage, including histories for all the processes that were, are visible in the trace. So this is a way to see, well, who's consuming the most file? Who's doing the most file I.O.? It's the sidebar in this case. I don't know why sidebar is even running. But uh, so that's something for me to follow up on. And you can double click and see, kind of like in Process Explorer, a detailed timeline of where that activity took place. So this is at 4.32 AM. This was a few minutes ago. Service host had a little CPU usage here. 28% CPU. Uh, there's a number of other data mining tools in here, like if we want to see what the hot files are, this file summary dialog shows us that. Shows us the in sorted order by total events on a particular path, the opens, closes, reads, writes. And you can look at this in a few different ways. You can look at, if I want to see how many times a particular file has been hit in a particular subdirectory, this is a navigation tool to see that. Or like what's by extension how many events per extension. And the reason why I added this, and it's relevant for uh, certain scenarios, is we're working with, through the Windows 7 development process, with OEMs that have software that they load up on their machines, and we want to help them to op optimize the performance of this. 
the team that's working with the OEMs actually asked for these two views so that the OEMs could separate activity caused by their stuff versus system activity in a very easy way to see what parts of the file system they were accessing. There's a number of other views that I'm not going to get into. Uh, those of you that went to Aaron's talk did see the process tree. And that's one of the things that I think is the most, uh, is very useful for being able to drill down on something very quickly. So this is a, a first look at filtering in process monitor. Oftentimes I run process monitor, I've got some process that I want to watch. If it's got a window visible, then you can drag that toolbar bullseye that's on the process monitor toolbar over the window, drop it, and that automatically sets a filter for that process, very easily letting you zoom in on just that activity. But if you've got a case where the, vis the process doesn't have a, a visible window, how do you do that? Open this up and then double click. When you double click, it goes to that first event in the trace related to that process and then you can right click and do this, use this quick filter, include PowerPoint. And now we're just seeing the things that PowerPoint has done. To undo the filter, just type control R. The filters are non-destructive, so this is just man manipulating what you see, not the data that's there behind what you see. And there's a few other quick filters up here which let you filter by classes of activity. If you just want to see registry activity, you love, file, you love Regmon, you want to see just Regmon type stuff, then you can filter out file system, network, and process related activity and just get re reg registry related activity. All right, I think we're ready to go back and take a look at that case, that log file that I was sent by the demo guy. And for that, I'm going to launch Process Monitor with the Run32 key, the uh, switch. When you're on 64-bit versions of Windows, you need to, if you want to do live capture, you need to run, you just run Process Monitor, and it will extract from its 32-bit image the 64-bit version of itself dynamically and launch that. But if you're on 32-bit, uh, if you got a log file that's from a 32-bit Windows system and you want to look at it on a 64-bit system, you need to do so with the 32-bit version of Process Monitor. The way you can launch the 32-bit version of Process Monitor is by launching it with the Run32 flag right here. So I just made a shortcut for that so I can easily get to it. And this demo machine was a 32-bit Windows 7 machine, so I needed to open up the 32-bit Windows machine. So let's go open that stock viewer application. And this is a full trace of everything that was going on. I want to zoom in just on stock viewer because that's the thing that was taking a long time. So go to event, do a quick include, and now I'm just on stock viewer. The next step, that delay was roughly a minute and a half. So technique for tr troubleshooting delays like that is looking for gaps in the timestamps to see where there might have been some pause in what the application was doing that could have showed up as that visible delay. So I'm going to scroll down here quickly to see we're at 1 minute 27, 20 seconds over on the left side until we see a big jump. 21, oop, 32. So we had just a jump from 21 to 32. And what I did was start looking around what was happening right before that big delay from that jump from 21 to 32, which happens right here. If you look, there was a load of the RAS AD helper DLL. There's references to TCP IP parameters. If I scroll scrolling further back, there's actually references to certificate revocation list, registry keys, and cryptographic registry keys. And I, so I was at that point, hmm, this seems to have something to do with cryptography and accessing the network and certificate revocation lists. But that delay, that, that jump that we saw there was from 27 to 32, that doesn't account for that full minute and a half, so that might not be it. So I went and found the next delay, and there's the one from 32 to 44, and there, this one also has that same pattern. There's proxies, well, here we are, 32 to 44 I'm in the wrong place. Here we are, 32 to 44. I'm looking at internet settings. And so at this point, I looked further and I found another similar pattern. And I noticed that all of these pauses were 
right before then, they had a common registry query. So I'm going to go ahead and set a filter for internet settings connection, which is what I did to see if I could isolate this delay. I'm going to right click and include that. And now look at the timestamp sequences we see there. We see 21 jump to 32, 32 jump to 44, 44 jump to 56, and so on. And I went and then looked, confirmed that every single one of those was a query of certificate revocation list parameters and then TCP IP configuration. My next step was to ask him if the system was connected to the network. And the answer came back, no. La the demo machines are never connected to the network for obvious reasons. So I searched the web and le learned that the de delays are caused by runtime signature verification. And so I searched for certificate revocation list and runtime signature verification. Then I verified that this process was a .NET process by looking and seeing in this process, loaded process list that it's got .NET components in it. So that confirmed that it was a .NET component, and the KB article that I found with that search is this one right here, which says, a .NET Framework 2.0 managed application that has authentic code signature takes longer than usual to start. And coincidentally, not coincidentally actually, we had just digitally signed the stock viewer right before this as well, which I didn't anticipate causing any problems. I digitally signed it with the SysRternals certificate so that we could use app lockers capability to, that would authorize software based on certificate. Turns out once we signed that application, then .NET said, oh, this thing is signed. I need to go see if the certificate's been revoked. Turns out that if you think about what it's doing here, it's not really doing much good of, uh, at all. It's not really doing anything security related because you know what it does if it can't talk to the cer certificate revocation list server? Just continues to load the DLL. So it's like, all right, this delay is really useful. Really, really feeling a lot uh, secure. This fix right here tells you that once you apply this hotfix to .NET 2.0, which is in later versions of .NET, that you can add this you create a manifest file, an XML file, and stick it next to the process, next to the image on disk that says generate publisher evidence equals false. And what that will do is cause .NET not to go to the internet looking for that CRL. So a few minutes later after I'd got, he basically sent me the file. I spent about five minutes finding those delays, did an internet search, found this article, made this file for him, sent it back and said drop this in the directory, and it worked and that we were over that hump and able to, to deliver a very exciting keynote at TechEd US. All right, let's talk about error messages now. This one came in from somebody in PSS. So I've been, Microsoft support makes heavy use of the system internals tools and they send me really cool examples of how they use the tools with, to help customers solve problems. In this one, a uh, customer contacted Microsoft support because they were trying to send an email subscription from SQL reporting services and they couldn't attach the image file to the email that they wanted to send. Microsoft support spent 34 hours looking at this thing. Where's the 34 hours come from? At that point the engineer needed to go to the restroom. <laughs> he, well one of the steps they took in that 34 hours was having the customer try it on another identically configured SRS system and on that other system it worked. So it's something about the dif some difference between these two machines where it would work on one and wouldn't work on another. This is a great uh, kind of situation to have when it comes to troubleshooting with process monitor because now you've got a, a good system and a bad system and you can compare the behaviors of the two to look for differences that might indicate the root cause. PSS tried to reproduce this in-house. Same OS, same software, same patches, everything. Couldn't reproduce it. So finally, somebody said, when in doubt, run process monitor. So they decided to run process monitor and compare the traces. And I've got both of those traces here. Let's take a look. And uh, so SQL fail and SQL succeed. Or SQL work. 
So what you need to do in a situation like this is try to, to correlate the activities between the, the successful and the failing operation. Find anchor points where you see references to particular register keys and then align yourself between the two and then start comparing. This is not, uh, oftentimes is not a, just a few second operation. This can take a while for you to find anchor points and start to line things up and then meticulously go through looking for where things start to diverge. So I'm going to save us the trouble of walking through that manually and take you right to where they saw things go haywire on the failing system. So the anchor point they found was this reference to this register key, this CD00018 blah, 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 blah. And the result, it was reading a, a value that returned CDO.message1. And so in this trace, they found that same registry reference right here, CD001, reading that same registry value. This is the working trace that I'm looking at right now. And so they scroll a little, they go down a little bit further, and they see the next thing that this thing is doing is querying the control panel desktop. And then querying this multi UI language ID. And the, then querying down here some more values. Let's go back and take a look at the other trace to see the next thing that happened after it read this up here. In this case, it's reading multi language ID. Whoops. What happened there? Work. I seem to have something happened with the mouse and I've lost my place. Let's see where I was. Oh, the CDO message one. Here I go. Control panel desktop, multi language ID. Here, control panel desktop, multi language ID. Let's go a little bit further. Name not found, 005A01. Name not found. Well, things are lining up pretty nicely. Let's search again. No. Did I open the same thing? Here, let me look at, make sure I'm looking at the right thing here. CD control. Uh, I must have copied the wrong file. 28591. This is the failing one. 28591. Oh, there it is. I just didn't go down far enough. What this thing did uh, subsequently in that trace was query this code page value, and we don't see that in the other trace. You can actually see it more clearly here, side by side, where here's the reference to that cdo.message1 that I saw, cdo.message1, and then in this trace, it goes off and looks at desktop, which was what we were looking at, multi-language ID. In this other trace, the next thing it did was query this Oh, that's why, because I just skipped over it. This code page, that's the line that's right there missing from that second working trace that is present in the failing trace. So what they did at this point was jump in reg, in, using the registry editor to that location in the registry that was queried on that failing system. And this is what they saw on the failing system was this code page key had a whole bunch of entries that were empty. Whereas on the successful system, the, that when I looked at that same key and it was working. They didn't actually see references to those values in the trace. We just saw that one reference to that code page identifier, but that was enough to get them to go look at this and see that there was a difference here. So they exported the registry key from the working system, imported it in the six, into the failing system, and voila, it started to work and the problem was solved. This other case, this next case is the, a user complained that they were unable to, this called in their support guys, they complained they were unable to browse the web. They would get a connection error from IE, but they would try other network connections like FTP, you can see down there, that worked fine. So it was something that had to do with HTTP being blocked. The admin went about the normal troubleshooting you would do if you ran into this. They deleted the IE cache, problem still there. They checked the DNS gateway, the IP settings, everything looks fine, same as everybody else's system. They tried other outbound ports. Like I said, no problems. So what was the problem here? They captured a process monitor trace. And in this case, they started looking through the operations. They wanted to zoom in just on Internet Explorer. 
Where's the Internet Explorer? Let me find Internet Explorer. Oh, no, I got the wrong one. Long, long file here. IE. Here we go. They started looking through this, and nothing in the registry, nothing in the traces indicated any pr problems. They didn't see any references to third party things they didn't see on other working systems. So then they started meticulously looking at the stacks to look for third party components because they suspected this had to do with a third party add in to IE. And in fact, once they got to this, let me go back to the top. Once they got back to software.log, this query right here, they looked at the stack and they, something stood out here that didn't look like something they'd seen as a normal system component, and that is this VSDATANT.sys driver. Anybody ever heard of that driver? A few people. They looked at the properties. You can double click on this and see what it is. True vector device driver. That still didn't ring any bells for them. What is this thing? So they did an internet search for what this thing was, and it showed that this is a component of Zone Alarm's stateful firewall. They, all, they didn't have that installed, but the internet search further showed that Cisco VPN's client also uses this. You can see that stateful firewall setting was checked on this particular machine. That, tr that rang a bell because they'd uninstalled the VPN client from this machine before they moved it across domains. And so, hmm, it looks like the uninstall of the VPN client left something behind here, this driver. So next they turned their attention to trying to get rid of the driver. And for that they used auto runs. How many people still use MS config? And you're actually admitting it to me? <laughs> using MS config is like walking around in a room with a blindfold on, the lights off, and your hands tied behind your back. <laughs> and the reason why, there's a number of reasons why. First of all, it shows you very little about what actually auto starts. When you're talking about auto start things, there's a tremendous number of ways things can software can put itself in the system to get automatically invoked when you perform common operations like boot, log in, run explorer, run IE, run Windows Media Player, lots and lots of vectors that MS Config simply doesn't look at. It basically looks at the run keys and the startup folder, and that's it. So that's where auto runs comes into play, because auto runs will show you all of these other locations. And for each location, it will show you the entry with whatever's registered there. So here we see HQ's local machine system, current control set, control terminal server, WDS, whatever startup programs, that we've got something called RDP clip monitor there. It, this list is really daunting, so it, we divide it up into subcategories. So if you're interested in just IE things, you can go over to IE, sidebar gadgets even, network providers, where, do these, where does this list come from? There's no master database anywhere of these things. This list has grown over time since we made the first version of Auto Runs back in 1996, and it had roughly the same number of settings that MS Config looked at. It's grown over time for several reasons. One is personal experience installing software and seeing it cause problems, and then going and looking at where it's registering itself. And the second is looking at where malware infects machines, and also adding those to Auto Runs. But this view is overwhelming at this point with its thou literally hundreds and hundreds of entries. So that's where these filters come in at the top where you can hide Microsoft and Windows entries because most problems, in fact, 99.99999% of problems are third parties. <laughs> and then you refresh and now you're just seeing the things that are th not part of Windows and not published by Microsoft. If you really want to be sure that somebody's not lying to you, like malware's not lying to you. You want to say verify code signatures, and that will only show you things that are not signed by the Windows publisher or the Microsoft publisher. Part of not just troubleshooting, but just regular good system hygiene is running auto runs on a periodic basis and making sure that your system is clean of junk that's clogging your login process or boot process. So let's, you know, while I'm here, let's go ahead and clean out some of the junk that I see here. <laughs> oh, run as administrator.
Now that we're admin, we can get rid of it. Actually, I'm violating one of the golden rules of troubleshooting. Anybody know what that rule is? What? Backup. Yeah, never cause permanent damage. Because a lot of times troubleshooting is a, a very kind of exploratory process where you're like, hmm, I wonder if it's this. And this setting, let me go change that. Let me go delete that. Let me go delete that file. And then you go down a little bit further down that path and you go, oh, that wasn't the problem. It's something else. I really want to get back to where I was. And now you can't. So the best practice would be to do this. But I, I don't really want to get back to this point, so let's just kill it. <laughs> Some of the other features of auto runs. The search online here, which will search with your favorite search provider, which I'm sure is the right search provider. We don't need to talk about that. We can look at the properties of the image. Here, this will open up the Explorer image properties, which you get a, a kind of preview look at those properties down here. And you can do the jump to, which will take you into the registry or the file system to where this thing is registered if you just want to go and take a look at what's going on around that lo particular location. In this particular case, they opened auto runs. And what I've just done is load an ARN file. You can save these things as files. Auto runs also comes in a command line form if you want to automate this. Or you want to scan your machines, collect that data, and then parse it with something like Excel. What I, this person did is send me the ARN file right before they did the delete of this VSADANT thing. Or VS, what was it called? VSD? Yeah, there it is. This true vector device driver. So they found it here listed in the loaded drivers or services key. And so they ended up just disabling it and their problem went away at that point. One more thing, if you want to see what exactly are the locations that Auto Runs knows about, you can see that by going up to options and saying include empty locations. And then it will show you even locations that have nothing that passes the filter. And this is the complete list, then authoritative list of what Auto Runs is aware of. Let's talk about application crashes now. How many people have seen an application crash? <laughs> Just trying to keep you awake, get some blood circulation going. How many people have seen one in the last few days? Okay. Have you, has anybody troubleshooted it? I don't know what that word is. Troubleshot it? Troubleshooted it? Nobody? All right. Hopefully I'll be giving you some ideas on how you can go about doing that here. Now, an application crash, I used to not even talk about application crashes because most of the time, if an application crashes, you're like, oh, that application has a bug in it, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's really up to the developer to go fix that bug. That's, that was the philosophy I started with. Then I switched to the always run process monitor philosophy, which a lot of times can show you things like access denied errors that end up causing an application to crash. But more importantly, it's not always the application itself that's responsible. It's something loaded into it. That's especially obviously true with these things like, that are containers, like IE or IIS that load third-party stuff into them. But it's even true for re standard processes that you might not think of loading things into them because there's software that installs itself as hooks ac all across the system. So that's why it's, I, I find it always valuable to, when I get a crash to go look at it to see if there's a root cause that's something that I might be able to deal with, like by getting rid of an extension. The key to troubleshooting a crash is to find the crash dump file. Whenever a process crashes, Windows generates a dump file. It's a copy of its memory that you can look at in a, kernel, in a debugger like WinDebug and poke around to see what's going on. If you're on a pre-Vista system, finding the dump file is really easy. You get that, we're sorry, we've crashed dialog. You, you click on see what data this error report contains. That opens that second dialog there. Then you say view technical information about the error report, and then that shows you the path to the dump file. Notice that we've got, we're, we no longer apologize for crashing. Now we just tell you that, hey, it crashed. Have a nice day. <laughs> Close the program. And the problem on Vistan Hire from a crash dump analysis perspective is that the system doesn't save crashes by default. Once it generates them, it sends them up to the Windows Online crash analysis site, it deletes them. 
So the qu question is, how do you get access to those crashes? One of the ways that you can do that is by not dismissing that dialogue and attaching to the process in real time. Let's do that right now with Dave's application. Dave Solomon, my co-author on Windows NT, uh, if you came to the kernel changes talk, you've seen this application before. This is ACVO, which is Dave's only Windows program, and this is what it does. And he claims, again, that he intended to make it do this, but I know that he just gave up trying to make a real program. So at once we've got this thing in this crash state, let's go and attach to it with a debugger. So this way we don't have to look for a crash dump file. And the key to debugging a crash, when you attach with a crash uh, debugger, you're going to be in the context of this thread, which is the debugger break-in thread. You want to open the threads, pro processes and threads window, which I've done here. These are visible through here, processes and threads. This will show you a list of the threads in the process. And what you want to do is look through the threads, looking for any thread that has a stack that says fault or error or exception in it. And that first thread, which is the main thread of Acvio, you can see, based on the stack, that it did an un unhandled exception, and that ended up calling into the error reporting code. Not very interesting. This is a case where it's Dave's fault that this program crashed, and only Dave can fix it. But let's go take a look at a case where somebody was able to work around a problem. Oh, one, and this slide, by the way, is here because there's some processes that where if you've got multiple processes with the same name and you're not sure which one is the one that crashed, you can go look at the, while that crash dialog is open, you can look at the were fault process in Process Explorer, look at its command line that you can see there in its process properties. And one of the arguments that it passes to it is the process ID of the process that's crashed and the one that the Windows Error Reporting Service should go take a look at. So this is especially useful for IE crashes. Now that we've got multi-process IE, if one of those tabs crashes, you can attach to the right process using this technique. But what I always do on Vista and Hire is archive my crashes. And that way I don't have to always be sitting there ready to attach to the process when I've got that crash dialog. The, this is the registry key you can configure so that Windows, Vista, and higher systems always save crash dump files, and you can specify how many to keep in that folder. And that's what I recommend you do on your servers, for sure, and your clients if you're interested in uh, collecting uh, crash dump history. But always on a, a server, I think that's important to keep a record of what's going on. All right, how do you analyze a dump? Well, I've actually talked about this a little bit. And if, obviously, if you suspect an extension, you're looking for the stack, through the stacks, looking for third party uh, components that are loaded into the process that are near the site of the problem. And you want to check for a new version or uninstall it if the problem persists. OK, this particular user sent me this case where he tried to open a Windows Media player, player file in Media Player, but well, would consistently get this crash right there. So they ended up opening up the crash dump file. They'd actually just taken the Windows, uh, take, sat uh, at one of these seminars in uh, TechEd. And they ended up doing a bang analyze dash V, which is the other thing you can do, which works really great for cases where you, you've got a crash dump file. Bang analyze dash V has the debugger do some work for you. It's going to apply its own heuristics. So the heuristics that I just talked about of looking for exception or fault in the thread stacks, this is doing a little bit deeper version of that, looking for, hey, what might have been the cause of the, the crash here? It's trying to resolve symbols, so this will take a second. Maybe if I disconnect the network, it'll go faster. Okay, this is taking a long time. Aaron also had problems with networking in here earlier. Let's, so I'll just go and show you a screenshot here of what the analysis showed. It showed that it thought that the cause was probably this, a DLL called EVR, and this function, C monitor array 9, init D draw monitor info. This EVR DLL, see if this thing has come back, no, I'm still busy. That EVR DLL 
is a Microsoft component. He, at that point, did a web search for EVR monitor crash and found this web page. The video application crashes when you play a video if five or more monitors are attached to the computer. <laughs> Guess how many monitors he had attached to the computer? You can't have too many monitors. You really can't. And so this is a hot fix for that case that he's actually, in, you can probably guess what kind of industry he's in. What, the industry where everybody's got monitors all around them. You know those guys that sent the world into an economic recession? Those guys. He's one of those. And so he applied the hot fix and the problem went away. Our final topic is applying that crash analysis technique to kernel dumps. And how many people took Dan Pearson's class uh, one of his sessions, attended one of his sessions on crash dump analysis. I'm giving you the literally five minute version of his 75 minute talk. <laughs> but it's just as good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm giving you like crash dump analysis 101 here. Uh, by the way, uh, did Dan show you crash dump screens from real, real world crash dumps? Did he show you any of those? Yeah? Oh. Uh, for those people that haven't seen them, I, I just have to share some with you because I collect these things. Here's a sideways one at the airport. Bank machine, airport monitor, ticket vending uh, machine in, at the Barcelona train station, holiday blue screen at the airport. Blue screen, you can, this is a Windows 95 blue screen, but you can buy a belt buckle that has a blue screen on it. You can also buy a t-shirt that has a blue screen on it. <laughs> I think we know why CompUSA went out of business. That's Dave. Did Dan share this one with you? This is Dave analyzing. He's at the airport with his family, checking in, and sees this blue screen up there. And that's him. He's gone up. He's pointing at it. And he's figured out what the problem is, and he's explaining it to the people in line. <laughs> This is uh, on my way, this was earlier this year in Heathrow. I, came, I was coming back from Austria from a vacation. That's a close-up of it. You guys can save this as a, if you want, I'll send this to you and you can troubleshoot it after the seminar. This is also at airport. Let's skip that one. <laughs> Actually, this one's kind of funny. It, I ran across this book in the bookstore where I uh, normally go get coffee at lunch. It's called The Joy of Swearing. And I open it up and, wow, must have been written by an IT pro. They've got this chapter in here called The Big Blue Screen. Actually, when you look at that, it's about blue screen, matte blue screens in, in uh, movies, you know, where they put the blue behind you and they can put you wherever you want. That's what it's referring to there, but I thought it was still appropriate. This is the MGM Grand. <laughs> this is a, a conference room at Microsoft, I'm afraid, I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> and we can't even get it. The, the monitor to display the right way. And this is the elevator at a new Microsoft office. <laughs> this is Times Square. It's kind of an embarrassing one. This, anybody notice this one? Anybody recognize this picture, what it's from? Yeah, the, the Beijing Olympics, the opening ceremonies. That's a blue screen projected up onto the side of the... There's a, a better shot of it. That's not really what we wanted. Uh, you can see it up here. <laughs> Subway in New York. So there's been some embarrassing uh, uh, blue screens out there. But anyway, let's, let's get back to the task at hand. How do you troubleshoot a blue screen? Various follow the same steps. You need to find the crash dump file. And you need to do base, uh, the bang analyze dash V. That's the basics. Get the debugger installed on the machine. Point it at the symbol engine, find the crash dump, open it, and type bang analyze dash v. And oftentimes that will solve the problem. Let's take a look at a real world case somebody sent me. After they'd taken this class, the case of class, they went back to their office and they had had these machines that were spon spontaneously, sporadically rebooting across their network. And they hadn't bothered to take the time to go figure out what was going on. It was just this constant background annoyance. Once they saw this, they decided to take a look to see what was causing it. They found 
the event log entries on those machines that indicated, well, in fact, they'd rebooted from a, a crash because that's the default operation. So they opened up the crash dump file. Did a bang analyzed dash V, which is as easy as clicking on that hyperlink. So you've really got to be lazy if you don't want to analyze the crash dump. We're uh, running into network delays here, of course. Let's just give this a few seconds and if this doesn't come up, there we go. What you see here is it point the finger right at this CPQ team image. And if you look at the stack up here, this is a wor system worker thread that call into TDI, which called into the TCP IP stack, which called into NDIS, which then ended up, ended up here, and that's where the blue screen took place, where the illegal operation took place, and that's why the analysis points the finger at this guy. This is really, uh, I, I consider this a little bit questionable because what's going on here is racial profiling. This is the analysis engine goes, huh, who made that module? Microsoft, well that's, we're pretty good. How about this guy? TDI, that's Microsoft image. TCP IP, that's a Microsoft image. NDIS, Microsoft, ooh, third party. Probably that guy's, <laughs> that guy's fault. The file properties, when he went and looked at it, showed that it was the HP ProLiant network driver, and you can look at the version number, and actually the, this is easier now. You just click on that, and uh, he had the full dump, which actually had the version number in it, which is why you see it here. Well, you see the, the date, and he went to HP site, found a version that was newer, installed it, problem gone, no more spontaneous reboots. So that brings us to the end of the session. What I hope you've learned here are, aren't, isn't the recipe. That's not the point that, that there's, if there was a recipe for being able to solve computer problems, then I'd give you the recipe. But there is no recipe. It's almost an art form, and it's one that you get better at the more you do it. Because you start to get experience into what the system looks like on a normal basis, what the components are normally going to be operating, get a feel for what's uh, expected and what's not expected, and that's especially useful for when you're looking at stacks and when you're looking at error codes. So what I hope you're going to take away here isn't the recipe, but rather a list of tools that you can turn to when you've got these kinds of problems, a basic understanding of how to use those tools, and a basic understanding of the kind of techniques you might apply to root cause a problem. I encourage you, whenever you run into one of these types of problems, to always take a, just a few minutes and follow some of these steps because you never know if you're going to be able to learn something along the way or even root cause the problem. Sometimes we just don't have time. I mean, I don't have time to troubleshoot all the problems that I run into and sometimes I'll just move on, but whenever I can, I try to get to the bottom of what's causing these problems. Some other resources, like I mentioned, the case I didn't explain on my webcast link, the System Turtles video library, which is a library I made with Dave Solomon, in-depth tutorials on a bunch of the tools and troubleshooting, my blog, Windows Internals, of course, the best book on Windows Internals there is. And if you've solved one of these things yourself, if you go home and solve one, please capture screenshots, capture the log files, screenshots and log files together, and send them to me, and then I'll add them to my collection and potentially use them in, in another class to help other people learn. So with that, I want to thank you very much. I want, please fill out your evaluations. Send me an email if you've got a question afterwards, and I hope you guys have a great trip back. It's been great seeing you all here in Berlin for, uh, I think, a fantastic tech ed.